Hi guys and welcome back to another flip lesson. Um, today we're learning about weathering. Um, this image in the background is a really nice example of a couple of different types of weathering which we'll be talking about later on. But you might recognize it. That is the Palisades sill, a very old igneous intrusion, about 250 million years old, that kind of came up when Pangaea broke up. But first, what is a chemical change and what is a physical change? First, a physical change is how an object appears that changes. So a nice example would be like this um, here on the right. Okay, This is ice changing form. It's melting into water. But that's a physical change because whether it's frozen or not, it's still water. It's just how it looks. It's changing how it looks. Whereas a chemical change, like these couple examples here on the bottom of uh, fireworks, and we have another chemical change that's burning. That's an oxidation reaction. You learn that when you get to chemistry. This is where the composition of the object is changing, where it actually starts as one thing and at the end is something else. Now, why is that important? Because the two types of weathering, as we're looking at right now, are physical and chemical weathering relating to the physical and chemical changes that occur. So very simple, straightforward. If the rock that you have to begin with is the rock that you have at the end, that's going to be this, physical weathering or mechanical weathering. We also refer to it that way. Chemical weathering, you know that it's chemical if the minerals themselves have been changed. The product, in other words, what you have at the end, the result is something actually different chemically at a chemical level than um, it was originally. So if the rock after is different at the chemical level um, at the end, then we have a chemical change versus a physical one. Here are a couple examples. We're going to start with physical weathering. Frost action, also known as ice wedging, is pretty much when water seeps into the cracks in, inside of a rock. Right? Lots of cracks in, in a lot of these rocks out here, and you get water seeps in. And water is a very special substance in that when it freezes, instead of like most objects that contract or get smaller, compress when they freeze, water expands. It's a very powerful um, force, and it can break rocks wide open. And that's also why we looked at the Palisades earlier, because the Palisades is a really nice example of a lot of this happening. At the bottom of the Palisades, there's a big pile of something that we refer to as talus. And talus is basically a bunch of broken off rocks that have come off a cliff and are now sitting at the base of the cliff. OK, this, uh, again, here's, here's that example. And actually, you can see some of that on the bottom. Um, most of it's covered by trees, but there's a huge, what we refer to as a talus slope. Um, that's at the bottom of the Palisades. You'll also see something else going on here that you see a lot of red or rusting in the rock. We call that oxidation. That's a chemical uh, version of chemical weathering, a chemical change, but we're going to come back to that later on. So more examples here of frost action or ice wedging. This first thing that you see in that uh, top uh, right corner where it's circled in red is snow. So it's an indication that this is an environment that's cold enough that water freezes sometimes. And you need that. You need a cold enough environment to have any kind of physical weathering um, at all, in this case, ice wedging. So do we have that um, here in New York? Well, we sure do. I mean, this is definitely a location on Earth that gets cold sometimes. We get snow, things freeze. Okay, um, So we have those freezing thawing cycles, freezing Right, you have a, a liquid water turning into a solid ice, and then thawing is the reverse. Another example, this is actually how potholes are formed. Um, you'll read an article in class that's about potholes, and essentially this is something that only places in the world that have um, quite a bit of these freeze-thaw cycles. So uh, places like where we are, where it's you know pretty cold, but not always cold. So it's warms and it gets cold, and it warms and it gets cold. That's where you're going to have the most potholes, most frost wedging, most frost action. Okay, so a little bit more physical weathering. Again, this is something where 
The actual rock isn't changing chemically, but it, the appearance is changing. It's essentially where the roots grow into rock and help break it off. Okay. More examples of root action. I actually have another flip lesson when I was in New Orleans that shows an example of this type of weathering. Okay, when I was in Arches National Park last year, um, I took, uh, let's see, the photos that are on the top and the bottom right, and you can see some really interesting um, geological features, in this case, arches. This one on the bottom left we refer to as a mushroom rock. And these are formed because, essentially, wind blows, it picks up sand particles, silt particles that are hanging around, in this case a lot of sand, because if you look at the color there, right, you can tell that this here is all, um, well, at least you might have an idea. It looks like sand, and it certainly is a sandstone. Um, what will happen is that those little particles get picked up by the wind, constantly thrown against the rock, knocking against it, and eventually the weakest rock. In other words, the parts of these rock layers that have the weakest rock with the lowest hardness, okay, are those that are going to wear away the most easily. Now, sandstone has quartz in it, okay? So it's a very strong um, rock. Quartz has uh, a hardness of seven, so you're not going to, that sandstone doesn't get worn away as fast. But at Arches National Park, there used to be, like in here, there used to be some halite, some rock salt. There were a lot of rock salt layers because that part of the world used to have some um, ocean, some sea, there and eventually you had these layers deposited. So again, if you look here, in those spaces, okay, there used to be some weaker rock layers and you know the sand just kind of abraded everything nice and equally, but it just so happened the weak layers have eroded away. Now these things aren't going to be there forever, so make sure you go see Delicate Arch out in Utah whenever you get an opportunity. There's also exfoliation. So you know, if you ever heard of an exfoliating scrub or that people talk about this a lot with beauty product, products, right, the excess layer of skin, the dead skin that might be on the, uh, uh, on the outermost layer of your skin, right, that is coming off. That's what exfoliation is. Same thing for rocks. It just so happens that fluctuating temperatures often cause this. So that's, it gets hot, it gets cold. It gets hot, it gets cold. Now, it's similar to the freeze-thaw cycles because it's hot and cold, but it's different because there isn't necessarily water involved here. This image I actually took in Hawaii in, on my 2003 trip, and you can notice clear, clear exfoliation. So that's physical weathering, but there's also something else going on here. If you look carefully here, you see a lot of red, and that color is an indication that in this Mafic rock, so Hawaii, right, we have mafic rock. In particular, it's basalt, right? Hawaii is mostly made out of igneous rock, specifically uh, basalt from the hot spot that creates it. And that iron that's in there, that Fe, that iron, is turning into iron oxide, whoops, iron oxide, because over time, it, with its oxygen exposure to the air, in addition to the um, rain and water that'll, that'll seep through the rock, it, it gets exposed to this. And this process, this is a very important thing, not only does it go from iron to iron oxide, but this causes it to break down. That's why this is a version of chemical weathering. So what you're looking at right now is two forms of weathering. We have the regular old exfoliation, which is physical. The rock doesn't change. It just breaks off. Like I'd say that, that looks like a little more like regular exfoliation. And then in here, it's pretty clear that there's some rusting or what we refer to as oxidation. So just like your bike might rust out in the rain, Okay, we have iron staining here, that re those red stains there come from the iron turning into iron oxide, the, the equation that we put on the, uh, the last slide. This happens to rocks, and it breaks them down. Carbonation okay, is another big one. We're looking at a limestone. This usually happens with something that is limestone. Now, we say this contains carbon, more specifically something, I'm sorry, we refer to as calcium carbonate. Anything that contains this is going to um, react with some kind of acid, usually 
hydrochloric um, acid. So calcium carbonate is actually what makes up a mineral we got we know of as calcite. So anything containing that, and a nice example is going to be a rock that we refer to and we know of as limestone. As limestone. It's actually one way that we test to know if something has calcite in it or is limestone or marble, which is a metamorphosed version of limestone. We'll put a little hydrochloric acid on there and see. So this is actually why we get so many sinkholes. This is why a lot of people um, died in the Haiti earthquake not too long ago um, because there was this, ca this cave um, topography. We refer to this as karst topography. Okay, it essentially means there's a lot of tunnels and caves that have been built from limestone being eroded away over time. Rainwater seeps into the ground. All rainwater is slightly acidic, just a little wee bit, and some is more than others. And this um, somewhat acidic water mixes in with the limestone, breaks that rock down, and you get things like this. Hydration is going to be our, our, our last big example here. This is water reacting with a rock to break it down, right? Hydration, and if you ever see that, H-Y-D-R involves hydrogen um, or mostly, um, most often, um, water. Okay, So minerals such as feldspar and mica are going to absorb that water and they weaken. So I, I know this tiny bit of this is cut off on the bottom, but I just want you to really pay attention here to this image. Okay, If you start with rock and it's weathered by physical action, some kind of physical weathering, yeah, you might get something like sand, okay, which is pretty small particles, but not the smallest. You really need chemical weathering to break it down to a size like a clay-sized particle, our smallest sediment size. So here's a graph that you're very likely to see on the regents this year. Um, I know I've drawn some stuff on it, so let's uh, take a look. Basically, this is weather determined by climate. This is different climates of the world. So if I were to, let's say I'll put a Y right here. So that Y is in a location on Earth that has a very high, see, temperature at the bottom. So a temperature, it says, I'd say between 20 and 25 degrees Celsius. Okay? And then if we look at the Y axis and we follow the Y over, it looks like we're talking about between 150 and 175. What? Millimeters, but we're just measuring mean annual precipitation. Precipitation is often measured in um, inches or centimeters or some kind of um, height, height measurement. Okay, so let's take um, a look. If we look around at this chart, there's different levels of different types of weathering on here. So let's take a couple um, examples. First, frost action. Notice frost action is down here. All of this is frost action. Now why is frost action on the bottom left part, part of this chart rather than somewhere else? Okay. Basically, it's colder here. So this is the cold side, right? This is temperature. This is the cold side. Right? So you need cold in order for something to freeze to create frost action, to break down a rock by Water flowing in between the cracks, freezing, expanding, breaking it apart. You need cold. That's one. What else do you need? Well, you need some kind of precipitation. Think about it. Where's the water going to come from? Okay, if it's a super dry environment like a desert, you're not going to have that. Okay? So that's why you have a lot of frost action here. And we, before we move on, just to point out, this is the limit of temperature precipitation conditions on Earth. In other words, if we go to this point right here, there is no place on Earth that has 225 millimeters of precipitation every year and that is also has minus 15 degrees Celsius. It doesn't exist. So that's what that line, that's what this line here is for. Finally, chemical weathering. Okay, take a look. Moderate chemical weathering with frost action. Chemical weathering, chemical weathering. Notice chemical weathering likes heat. Does it also like moisture? Yes, it does, okay, because we have 75 millimeters and up for the right side of the chart. Finally, physical weathering versus chemical. This is the last thing you need to know. Cold and moist for physical, and you need a warm and moist environment to create chemical weathering. Thanks, guys.